Hey guys, so I'm going to do this test review in a couple videos. So I've got slides on here that I didn't take out because I'm going to kind of brush across them. But the reason why is when you take your final exam at the end of the semester, there might be some stuff on that. And we'll do a review for the final too, so don't get freaked out. But I want to get started. The majority or a lot of the test, about half of the test is on pain management and pain medications because it's huge. That's something big in our country. We, we treat it a lot. We give a lot of pain medicines. If you're working in the OR, if you're a recovery nurse, if you're ICU, ER, floor, whatever, pain management is important because people that are sick or injured usually have some form of pain. So I really kind of want to talk about that. There's 52 slides. I've left the slides up over on the side of my screen that I'm sharing with you just so that I can kind of follow along. And um, some of them I left, I'm going to touch base because I do want you to understand things because that will help. It's not just to memorize something and dump and run for the testing purposes. So let's get started. If you hear noises, I'm sorry, I'm at the inn in Jonesboro and I'm upstairs kind of trying to be in a more quiet place, but there's cars and dogs barking and everything else. So kind of spooky. Anyway, so let's look at pain management. So it is one of the most common reasons for people that seek health care. So we understand that people are coming. If they're in excruciating tooth pain, broken leg, you know, sprained ankle, sprained wrist, broken fingers, whatever, broken teeth. They're coming, heart attacks. I mean, it's all pain related. Um, so analgesics, we talk about them. They're painkillers. There's opioids, adjuvant, analgesic drugs. We have all of that. So it's something that we kind of, I talked about it in class. I spoke a lot about opioids and things like that. I do want to touch some bases that I really want you to understand. Um, the always think guys when you're thinking about everything is what am I going to do as the nurse and what is my priority for this patient and what's going on critically thinking prioritizing and acting as a nurse okay so that's what I want you to do um sometimes we have to figure out pain management we looked at that one of the things I do want you to focus on in your studies for the test on Thursday is what is a pain threshold as you see it says the level of stimulus needed to produce the perception of pain a measure of a psychologic response to the nervous system that is the threshold okay because we're going to look at the next slide which is pain tolerance this is where it gets different so you might have a patient that's legs bent in half and they're talking to you, maybe crying a little bit, maybe kind of grimacing, but they're talking and able to communicate. And the person over says had the same exact in injury. They're probably like, you know, they can't talk at all. They're throwing up, whatever. There's different tolerances. So we have to be very careful that we're non-judgmental. You want to always measure pain. Can you tell me on a scale of zero being no pain and 10 being your worst pain, where is your pain? Once they tell you that, then you want them to describe the pain and also tell you where the pain is. Don't ever just assume because they have a broken leg that the leg is what they're talking about. They could be having a pain in their elbow or maybe in their left big toe and they have a broken right femur, but their left big toe is painful because they've got gout or something. So always make sure you know where, what it feels like, what the level is and document that. So the tolerance is what a person can endure without interfering with normal function. So there are people that live with different chronic pain, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. What, so pain tolerance is important because if they can tolerate pain to a certain point, they can function. Other people can't. Don't be judgmental on that. Always measure, right? Where, what does it feel like, and uh, when did it start, the why, what, where, when, house, right? And describe it. And then you need to document that. The thing that I want you to go on to focus next is the difference between acute and chronic pain. If we have acute pain, it is a sudden onset. It's something that just happened. They're having pain. It usually goes away once the issue is treated and fixed. If we can fix it or treat it, the pain will go away. Chronic pain is persistent or recurring pain. People have a lot of chronic back pain. You'll hear that. Um, last three to six months, often difficult to treat. 
because the pot pain's been there forever. They've got a tolerance. You know, it's hard. You have to put tons of pain medicine towards it to get control or get it down. And lots of times with chronic pain, you never get rid of it. These people have to go to, to pain clinics and be treated differently and with combination of drugs. Um, so that is, I'm going to go back up one more. I want to go back up to that one again. Make sure you understand that. So if you have a scenario and they're talking about a person that's been recently injured, that is, and they have horrible pain or they have pains, whatever, that is an acute pain. If they've had a long term, they might have chronic pain. And with chronic pain, we have to take a lot of different things to treat it. And they don't always get rid of their pain completely. Um, also remember that the three to six months is our key little term there. So three months gr and greater, we're looking at chronic pain. Um, just know that a lot of things happen to the body with pain transmission. And we release histamines. We can swell. Potassium is so interesting, the serotonin in the brain. There's just so many things that happen when pain happens. That's why we need to control it because we have to help our body. The body is going, ah. I need to fix this. So it is so important. I'm not going to focus too much on that right now, but I do want you to understand that that's what's going on. Because as we move forward in pharma, um, pharmacology, we will look at pathopharm, uh, pathopharm, blah, 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 the pharmacology piece, and we look at the patho piece, especially next semester, we'll go into a little more of what's going on. So, um, but this is, I talked about different pain uh, situations. We have PCA, remember that, um, where we can hit the button and give ourselves pain medicine and PCA by proxy. Patient, but I want to go on record to say that no one should push the button but the client or the patient, period. If they can't do it, they don't need it done. Um, there's a lot of people that won't take pain medicine. It's interesting. Sorry, guys, my ears are Um, There's a lot of um, people that don't take pain medicine because they're very fearful of being becoming addicted to drugs. Um, there's opioid tolerances. We just have different things that can happen. There's breakthrough pain where we need to use something that's a sudden pain reliever, you know, to, to immediately give pain relief if they've got breakthrough pain. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the World Health Organization has three-step analgesic ladder that they want everybody to use, and you should use it as a nurse too. Step one is to do non-opioids. Opioids we know are addictive. So if we can do non-opioids, then the, it is better off for the patient. The next thing that we're going to do in step two is opioids with or without non-opioids and with or without adjuvants. If pain persists or increases, management um, then rises to the next step. So if you give opioids and we've given it with or without a non-opioid or another medication, then, and we're still having some pain or things are persisting, then we go to step three, which is opioids, which are indicated for moderate to severe pain, guys, administered with or without non-opioids or the adjuvant medications. So that is, they want you to start with less or something non-addictive and then work your way up. If you start at step three, jump the ladder, then you have surpassed anything. And then what are we gonna give them? You know, you, you, you can't help them. So what we try to do is go this non-opioids to opioids with or without. Um, and then the what, there's opioids that are indi indicated for moderate to severe pain. So if we can't get it with step one and step two, we go to step three, which are the ones for uh, moderate to severe pain opioids. So that latter is kind of interesting. Um, you might not be tested on it today, but it is something you need to go put into your mind for practice because you need to always remember how I said, if you're giving a medication, if you inject it and it goes into the vein, it's gone. Can't take it back. Same with this. If we start with a non-opioid, it doesn't work. We go to an opioid that's a less, that's not for moderate severe pain. It doesn't work. Then we can go to the severe. We can work our way up. It's just the same. Just think that direction. So it's good for practice. Um, opioid drugs. Um, this just breaks them down a little bit. The strong agonists are morphines, hydromorphone, oxycodone, mepridine, fentanyl, and methadone. 
the mild agonists are codeine and hydrocodone. And I know you see both of those and you're like, um, well, you didn't see both of them. I'm sorry. I saw both of them because I can't see. So you've got hydrocodone as a mild, but then as we get up to the strong, we have the hydromorphone. Okay. And then the um, mepridine is not recommended for long-term use because of the accumulation of the neurotoxic metabolite, um, nor epiperidine, uh, which can cause seizures. Ding, ding, ding. You need to know that. So mepridine, it can cause long, it can cause seizures. It is a neuro, it has, it creates the accumulation of a neurotoxic metabolite. That's all you need to know on that. So know if you're giving mepridine, meperidine, that it's uh, not ever recommended for long-term use. You can give it and you're not going to create a seizure, but someone that's taking it for long-term, they can start to have seizures. So it's very important that we understand that and that we teach our patients that. Okay, there's three classifications of the opioids. I just talked a little bit, agonist, agonist and antagonist and antagonist or non-analgesics. Um, our agonist, it binds, and I'm just reviewing this for understanding purposes. I'm not gonna ask you to regurgitate this on a test, but you need to understand if it's an agonist, what are we doing? Well, we're binding to an opioid pain receptor in the brain. Okay, so it causes an analgesic response, reduction in the pain sensation. If it's an agonist um, or an antagonist, we bind to the pain receptor, causing a weaker neurological response than a full one, also called partial agonist or mixed agonist. So that we get a little mixture. We don't get a full meal deal. And then your antagonist is the reverse effects of these drugs on pain receptors. They bind to the pain receptor and exert no response, also known as a competitive antagonist. So what do you say that means? All I'm saying is understand there's those three things. Just in your mind, for testing purposes, you need to understand if there's an agonist, it's going to do this. If it's an antagonist, it's going to do this. And it kind of it's self-explanatory because an agonist is in support of and antagonist is against, correct? So we just kind of think that direction. Um, I do want to point out on this slide for you know that we also use opioids for cough center suppression, treatment of diarrhea and balanced anesthesia. So it's not just us giving a pain pill or a shot for pain. So we do use them for these. And so sometimes you might be giving cough medication to your patient. They get a script for that to pick up at their local pharmacy and you would need to educate them that this does have this in it. So it's important. Um, contraindications. If they have a drug allergy, they do not need to take it. Severe asthma, we worry about respirations. Um, you need to use with extreme caution and patience with, and I want you to understand when you give an opioid, you are going to depress the CNS system. Everything goes down. Remember I said that low and slow. When we do that, we're going to have respiratory depression because our central nervous system is being depressed. We're not going to breathe as fast. Because of that, if I have a patient that has respiratory insufficiency, I already know they're not breathing well. I give them an opioid. What am I going to do? Suppress it even further. They're at high risk for respiratory arrest. So we need to be very careful. Elevated intracranial pressure. If I have a head injury, I can have an increased intracranial pressure. You'll learn more about that. But because of that, if I give an opioid, it can elevate that pressure more. And by elevating intracranial pressure, it can create a shift and they can become brain dead. So you can kill a person by giving an opioid to an elevated intracranial pressure person. So we need to be very careful with that. Morbid obesity or sleep apnea, same thing. If they're very heavy or they have where they stop breathing when they sleep, then they're going to have respiratory issue. They're not going to breathe as well. So if I give them an opioid, what am I going to do? Put them to sleep. They already stop breathing while they're sleeping, sleep apnea. And then I'm going to suppress the respirations more that you'll cause them to respiratory arrest and then they can have issue. The morbid obesity, the largeness is pushing down, right? Suppressing or constricting 
the, the rib cage from expanding completely. So we can have issues with that. When we lay down, if we have morbid obesity, we're also just like putting a giant big weight on them. So they're not going to breathe as well. So if I actually decrease their CNS, um, depress that and their respiratory status, then I can cause them to have a respiratory rest. A paralytic ileus and pregnancy are also two contraindications. Here it is, CNS, adverse reaction. CNS depression leads to respiratory depression and we can cause them to respiratory arrest. Ding, ding, ding. If you have anybody with a respiratory rate under 12, you need to be concerned of giving them opioids. If they have something under that, then we need to be reversing the drug. We need to reverse. Nausea and vomiting come from opioids. Urinary retention, this is a big one. Urate urinary retention can happen if a patient is taking opioids. So that means they cannot urinate and they need to understand if they get home and cannot urinate, then they need to be concerned because the urine's still building up in, they just can't get it out. And so that can become a problem. Diaphoresis and flushing, pupil constriction or meiosis. Um, if you have opioids on board, you're not gonna have dilation, you're gonna have constriction. And so when you go to assess your patient with your pen light, looking at their pupils, they're gonna be constricted. It's also a moment that you might know that a patient's taken opioids outside. So they come into the ER or they come into the clinic and you're doing an assessment and you notice their pupils are constricted. Might wanna make you go, ooh, they might be taking some opioids. Um, constipation, of course, we talked about that. One of the things that you want to always include in your education with a patient is that they need to take a stool softener, drink more fluids, increase fiber if they need to, so that they continue a bowel movement because, because everything's slow and low and depresses everything. It also depresses the GI tract. So because it's slow moving, they're not going to be able to have their bowel movement like normal. And because it stays in that GI tract, it's gonna suck more water or fluid out of what's in there. And it just becomes a brick and they become constipated. So it can become very uncomfortable for these patients. And of course, itching, which is a sign of an allergic reaction or an adverse reaction. So if we have itching or hives, we know they're allergic to it and we would want to flag that as an allergy. Those things are all very important. If they have opioid tolerance, guys, they're gonna need a larger dose. So what happens is, is you've given them opioids, they're taking them for pain and their pain starts to become worse or that it's not touching the pain that they have. At first they're doing okay, you give them the same dose, they're giving a da da da. Then you get to, all of a sudden you give them that dose and the pain's worse. They can't, they're not getting better with it. It's, they're having more or large. So you got to give them more because they become tolerant to it. And that is normal. So don't think if you're going to give someone 10 milligrams of something every day that they're going to be able to do that for the rest of their life. They can't. They're going to eventually going to need more and then in time need more and then in time need more. So it is something to understand. And that's what can cause a lot of problems for people. The physical dependence on this, it is a, a drug that causes addiction. It can be addictive and it's sad because people do get addicted to it. So we need to understand that about opioids. It's very important. And that's why you're seeing physicians not give as many of the opioids out there. Um, I'm not going to look at that. I'm going to pass over the reversal of this drug for overdose is Narcan. Remember I talked about it. It's a naloxone. It is so important that you know Narcan. Narcan is the drug that you pull and have ready if a patient has suppressed respirations that are lethargic and can't wake up or unresponsive and can't get aroused, then you need to give them Narcan. It's very fast acting. Um, and so you want to go ahead and give it and, but it is very fast acting within the system too. It's half-life is pretty short. So what happens is, is you give it, they'll come aroused, but if there's a lot of medication still circulating in their system, you'll probably most likely need to give a second dose. So always pull your second dose. If the patient's still becoming lethargic or respirations maintain, um, decreased. That is the one I want you to know, Narcan. 
Um, if they go to, if they have a tolerance and they start to withdraw, you're going to see anxiety, irritability, chills, hot flashes, joint pain. Um, they could tear, um, diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting, all of that, diarrhea, confusion, that comes with a withdrawal. So really those signs and symptoms you'll see with withdrawals, withdrawals from alcohol and other addictive properties. So we see those, that is a red flag. Their morbidity will increase as they're withdrawing from this. So we need to treat them so that they don't die. Anybody ever watch Little House on the Prairie? Little Albert gets hooked on the morphine and he goes through a withdrawal. They try to get him off and he goes to the withdrawal and it's horrible. The whole signs and symptoms. I'll have to show that to you in class one day. That's such a good show. Um, interactions. If I'm giving opioids, I don't want to have alcohol, antihistamines, barbiturates, benzos, um, any uh, monamine, oxidase inhibitors, MOIs. Um, or anything else that's going to be a suppressant. You can't give a suppressant with a suppressant because then we just suppress it all and they'll uh, um, respiratory arrest. If a patient respiratory arrest, they're most likely cardiac arrest because one will follow the other. Sometimes people will cardiac arrest just because the heart just stops, but lots of times it's a respiratory arrest and then the heart gives out. Just an FYI. Okay, we've got Kobe, Kobe. Codeine sulfate, which is an opioid, opioid agonist. Um, it's less effective. We don't really see it as much. It does cause nausea, guys, and vomiting. Codeine will make you throw up. So it is usually they give codeine, codeine with Finnergan, and the Finnergan potentiates the codeine and it makes patients, it gives it a, a better high. So they love it if you can give it together. It's a Schedule II drug. Fentanyl. Fennel is one I do want you to understand. We usually give it in a patch. Remember when I talked about patches, make sure you remove, wash the area good, make sure you put it in a different place so the skin doesn't break down. Fentanyl patches are for chronic long-term pain management. That's where we see them. We can dose fentanyl IV. It is roughly equivalent to 10, 0.1% milligram of fentanyl is equivalent to 10 milligrams of morphine IV. So it's potent. So that's why we like to put it on a patch and let it absorb slowly into a system for those folks. Dilaudid is the one people love. They'll ask for it. Can you have the D drug? That, that drug that starts with a D. Um, hydromorphone is the other name for it. It's very potent opioid. It is um, equivalent one milligram to seven milligrams of morphine. If you know about morphine, we normally give two milligrams of morphine. That's a very minor dose, two to four milligrams. We don't usually give more than that. If they're a cancer patient or somebody in excruciating pain, we might give five of morphine and it goes up in hospice cases. But one milligram of Dilaudid is equivalent to seven milligrams of morphine. It's pretty intense. Um, Meperidine is a schedule two. Um, we use it for migraine treatment. Um, it's an active metabolite, can accumulate in toxic levels and cause seizures. That's the thing I really want you to know about this drug. I want you to know it's a schedule two. I want you to understand that it can uh, accumulate in toxic levels and cause seizures. And we usually give this drug for, for migraines. So um, that's important to know. It's not for long-term use. You give a dose and they're not going to go home and keep taking it forever. Okay. Um, we're going to pass over that one, but morphine's a biggie. You just need to know about morphine. Um, we give it for severe pain. It has a high abuse potential. We can give it orally. We can inject it and we can give it rectally. We can give it an extended release too. So morphine is something that's been around for a very long time. We use it a lot. Um, hydrocodone. You hear a lot about that. That is a biggie, it's a class two. Um, the thing with hydrocodone, it can be combined with um, Tylenol or acetaminophen and that's Percocet. If it's a combined with aspirin, it's Percodan. And we give a lot of Percocet and Percodan out there. Um, and then Vicodin is hydrocodone. 
which is weaker than oxy, but it's combined with acetaminophen or Tylenol. That's your Vicodin and your Norco. These drugs you're going to see, these are the drugs, Percocets, Percodans, Vicodins, Norcos. That's what people are buying in the streets and taking. And it's what we give in the hospitals for pain management. Um, just be familiar with those. I don't need you to know a whole lot. What I want you to know about opioids is what are we going to do as the nurse? As we go through, there's others. This is a big one. I left it in. So down the road, we can talk about it. Don't worry about that one at this point. But Narcan comes up next, and that is the pure opioid antagonist. It's going to work against. Remember I said there's an agonist that's four, and the antagonist is against. This is against the opioid. We give it so that we can reverse the opioid. If they are res going, their respirations are down, they look like their, their blood pressure is down, they're, not, they're getting ready to respiratory arrest, we need to reverse it with Narcan. Okay. Tylenol, I want you to know, it is, has a 24 hour um, limit. It's hep it's a liver toxic or heptotoxic. And so anything with the liver, if they have any issue with their liver, they do not need to take this. And one of the biggest things is alcoholism. Alcoholics, it affects their liver. So if they're an alcoholic, they don't need to take Tylenol because they're just going to kill the liver even more, right? We need to worry about it. But we need to know it's an antipyretic, it's an analgesic, it's an anti, um, has little to no anti-inflammatory effects, but people will take it for that still because it does help. But it's really known as an antipyretic. Um, go ahead and know about Tylenol. It's mild to moderate pain. Give it for fever. But if we're going to give a max dose. The max dose, I believe, is 3,000 milligrams in a day, a 24-hour period. But if I had an alcoholic, I would not give them the max dose. If they were going to take Tylenol, we would cut it back to at least 2,000 milligrams. And I'll be honest with you, I would probably look for something else. But sometimes you don't have choices. So you got to think about it. So here you go. It goes through it. It is 3,000. So 3,000 milligrams a day is your max dose for Tylenol. Older adults and those with liver disease, no more than 2,000 a day. Um, children also have a limit, but for right now, I want you to know the adult limit. Okay. Don't take it if you have an allergy to it, if there's liver dysfunction, possible liver failure, or if you have a G6PD deficiency. And I'm going to be honest with you, the G6PD deficiency, you probably won't see, but do know if there's an allergy or any kind of thing with the liver, you don't give Tylenol. Now, this will go through some of the things you need to know uh, about managing the Tylenol. Read through that slide and just review through your book of what you need to do. We do, we can reverse Tylenol. There is a medication to give and I talked about it. So go back through and look. Um, lidocaine is another one that we use transdermal. That means we're gonna put a patch on, right? It's an anesthetic, um, it, minimal adverse. It can cause a little skin irritation, but it's gonna numb up anything. We love lidocaine. You're gonna give it for many reasons. Lidocaine is great to numb up a cut if we're gonna suture it up so they don't feel it. We can give lidocaine and you'll learn this down the road. But we give lidocaine for an irritated heart. Um, we can give it intravenously. Always get a baseline of your vital signs for any analgesic. I want you to read these. We want that baseline vital signs and intake and output. We want to know. Assess for contraindications and drug interactions. Also, always get a history and ask for allergies. If they're allergic to anything, you don't want to give them something that could cause them a problem. Um, the pain is the fifth vital sign. Do not forget that. You always assess pain for every patient. Be sure to medicate your patients before the pain becomes severe. So um, to provide adequate analgesia and pain control. So I wanna talk about this for a minute. This is important as a nurse. You want to make sure you don't allow your patient to become writhing in pain. If they're writhing in pain, there, you, and you try to give them the pain medicine, they're not going to get pain relief for a while. It's going to take a long time. You try to give pain medicine to prevent them from getting to that highest point of pain. If say they have a, a pain of six 
and you give them pain medicine and you get them to a four and four hours has gone by and they can have another dose of this pain medicine. Do you want to just hold because they're not at six? No, our goal is to get them to zero. And if they're chronic painters, to get them to what's the best pain, tolerable pain. So you want to be ahead of the game. Now, if they're lethargic, if the respirate, respiration rates are low or anything like that, you don't give it, you hold it. If they're sound asleep and you can't wake them up, you don't want to wake them up and give it. But when they wake up, assess their pain. And if they have pain, then go ahead and treat them if they're able to get it. Don't work them out of their minds, but medicate them to treat their pain. And if you allow them to get super painful, you won't control their pain. It's important. You get ahead of it. So say you have a surgical patient and they're going to have incisional pain. You give them the pain medicine. One of the best educational things to tell the patient, they're going to say, I don't hurt. They're sitting in their bed like this. I don't hurt. They're not deep breathing. They're not coughing. They're not doing their incentive spirometry and they haven't gotten up to walk. They're going to have to do all of that. And to do that, it's going to create more pain. So what you have to explain to the patient is, is I understand that you're not hurting right now, but we're gonna do these things and it'll probably cause you some discomfort. So let's go ahead and give you your pain medicine so that it can be kicking in while we're getting up and getting ready to walk around the unit. So it's important to get ahead of the pain game, okay? I hope you understand that. If you have any questions, please email me before testing. Um, also, it says patients should not take other medications or over-the-counter preparations without checking with their physicians. Don't start mixing stuff up. People need to know that. You know, you don't go take tons of herbs and then taking your pain pills that you've been given to you or taking other analgesics. Um, if you have any adverse reactions or allergic reactions, make sure you call your physician. Always tell your patient that is so important so that we can note it in their chart and also treat them for the allergy if they need it. They might end up taking some Benadryl or something to help. Um, this talks about how the forms of it um, keep side rails up. Of course, safety is huge. If we give opioids, it can cause confusion. It can cause them to have dreams. It can cause them. So we don't want them to fall out of bed or get out of bed or crawl over the side rail and fall. We want to make sure safety, safety, safety. Um, always respirate 10 to 12. It says there, but 12 or better is the best. Okay. Um, always give it properly. If you're giving it IV, if you're giving IM, make sure you're giving it properly and how to give your shots, make sure you're in the right muscle, giving the right, um, length of the needle, you know, follow those guidelines. Okay. Constipation is huge guys. I've talked about it. I'll talk about it again. They get constipated. That's a given and they won't even realize it. So as soon as they start coming out of surgery or come in the hospital for whatever reason, we give them the stool softener if they're on pain pills. If you're the nurse, you're the patient advocate. You need to know if they don't have that to say, you know what, they're on pain medicine. They need a stool softener and get that order. Call the physician and get it ordered because they need it. You don't want them constipated. They're already going to hurt. That's going to create more issue for them. So it's very important. That's because everything goes slow and low with opioids. Change their positions frequently. We talked about that. It's important. Move them around. If they can't get up and walk, they need to move. They need to drink. They can't drink. They need fluids. It's important. Um, watch your vital signs. It will cause respiratory depression. If less than 10, it says there, um, you can get uh, diminished breath sounds or shallow breathing. We need to watch that. Patient's condition declines or pain continues. We need to call the doctor. Okay. You're going to monitor for these things. I'm not going to go through all. I do want to look at this one. Herbal products, fever few, related to the marigold family. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's used to treat migraine headaches, menstrual cramps, inflammation, and fever. May cause GI distress, altered taste, and muscle stiffness. May interact with aspirin and other NSAIDs as well as anticoagulants. So this is one that we need to put on our radar because if we've got a patient that's taking um, anticoagulants, we need to know if they're on fever few. Okay. Um, I had never honestly heard of it, but I will see. It's a possibility you might see this on your test. 
This is the one that will wrap up pain. Remember what all I said in class, if you were there, if you weren't there, just know slow and low, everything depresses with pain medications, opioids, and we need to give Narcan. It has a 12 hour half-life, it's very quick. We, I know that doesn't seem very quick, but when we give it, it will reverse immediately. But what happens is they start to go down again. We've even put people on Narcan, Narcan drips, just an FYI. -er. Anyway, I hope this helps. Study what we talked about in class, go through your chapter, and pain is a big piece of this test. I will be posting another couple videos on some of the other chapters that we've studied. They'll be coming up before the night is done. See you soon. Bye.